All right, everybody, it's time to start. Welcome to First Friday and Happy New Year. So appreciative of everyone who braved the weather. We have a, a full civic center and hopefully we have lots of people who are up and at them and listening to Facebook Live and, and uh, we'll catch it later on. We have some really good speakers lined up to you, for you this morning. We have some really good information that we will be sharing uh, before we start and actually after it's all over during our shout out time. So be sure and, and hang around to the end. Um, before we begin, I always like to um, give some time to our business sponsor. Our business sponsor is the, um, the business who selects a particular month and they coordinate with Terry Trout at Annie Mays and pay for the breakfast that we have, the warm muffins and the hot coffee and, um, and help sponsor the, the Chamber of Commerce through their generous support. And this morning, our business sponsor is Labet Health. So at this time, would you please welcome the president and the CEO of Labet Health, Brian Williams. Good morning. Happy New Year, everybody. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here in Memorial Hall driving over. It was seven years ago. I stood before you guys, and we were closing the hospital, and we didn't know what we were going to do. We had a lot of uncertainty. This year will be our fifth uh, year anniversary of our Independence Healthcare Center. We serve approximately 16,000 uh, patients a year at the center, uh, about 7,500 emergency room visits. And I tell you, without that ER, uh, certainly the last two years, I'm not sure uh, how much you know, loss of life and tragedy we've had. So thank you so much for your support of Labette Health. Without you, we don't exist. The other really neat thing, I think, um, you know, unbeknownst to all of us in this room, because you guys were a big part of the planning and, and developing of it, we created a rural emergency hospital. Well, that was codified in federal statute, and now that's a reality. Um, and people have come, come here, traveled here, talked to EMS and how we've worked together cooperatively. So really, once again, Independence is a leader, you know, in the United States. And so others will, will benefit from a bad situation that we inherited through the hospital closure, but we persevered and we're doing, doing really, really well. Uh, thank you to the city. Lacey's not here, but Kelly, thank you. And to all the city commissioners that helped us. Um, you know, last year we received an economic development grant for a million dollars that has certain stipulations and requirements over the next 10 years. We're going to get the base numbers um, to the city, and then we're going to complete the planning, and we're going to deliver on our promise to expand Independence Healthcare Center. So that'll be exciting. We wanted to start last year, but with all, you know, you've seen the, the video of the 100, 200 ships sitting off the coast. We've had a lot of issues with the construction project we have. That hospital will be completely renovated to benefit Southeast Kansas for the next 30 years. It was a $22 million project, and we've faced every problem, every challenge that you can imagine, down to getting little microchips to run our fire system, garage doors um, in Oswego to open the Oswego Clinic. So we've had a lot of challenges. But the good news is it's a new year. 2022 has to be better than 2021, right? Yeah, you know, we thought 2020 was bad, and now 2021 was much worse. Um, you know, um, so we're going to get there. We're going to look at, you know, we had a list. Fred Myers back there. I can't, you know, leave Fred. Fred did a great job representing your city, challenged me. I was a new guy. I'd been here. It was my fourth day in southeast Kansas when I met him. And uh, he said, you know, this is what we want. We want this, 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 and this. I've still got that list. We delivered on the ER, we delivered on the clinic, we delivered on an infusion center, and there's still a surgery center you know, out there that you guys would like. And uh, so if you continue to support us, we know you have a lot of choices. One of the challenges we face in Southeast Kansas, we have too many healthcare choices. They're not sustainable. And that's not an easy message to deliver, but there were 11 hospitals seven years ago, there's eight, and eventually, I don't know, uh, you know, where we'll end up. What we're going to do is try to do our best to work cooperatively with other people to benefit Southeast Kansas, not just Independence, not just Parsons. We all have to work, work together. My boss, the board chair, uh, Charles represents you guys on the regional board, Brad Oaks, and a lot of, you know, your friends in this area, but my hospital board chair is uh, Perry Sorrell, and Perry Sorrell, I ask him often, 
why, why did we form co-ops to cooperate? Why did farmers form co-ops for buying power? Hospitals need to do the same thing, you know, and uh, we can do that. And we've had some great conversations from, with some local CEOs, and that's, that, I promise you, is going to happen. Um, so, how much time I got left? Two minutes? Lisa says, don't be, <laughs> don't go over. And you guys know I can talk a long time. Um, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it's not a popular message. I hate the mask as much as anybody else. Um, but I know Becky could get up here and do a much better job. That young lady's working night shifts. We have the same staffing shortages. You can't go to a restaurant and not wait, right? Please take care of yourself. Please wash your hands, wear a mask. Look, I, I don't want to make a political statement. I'm sorry that it's been politicized. It shouldn't have been. If you're not vaccinated, I'll just give you the statistics. In the last 30 days, we've admitted 40 patients into our hospital. Uh, 33 of them were, were unvaccinated. Seven were vaccinated. 11 have died. 11 out of 40, okay? So the vaccine does work, um, contrary to what anybody wants to talk about or say, it does work. Zero 100% boosted patients have been hospitalized, okay? We're gonna have to live with it, just like our ancestors did with the uh, Spanish flu. It will become endemic, and we're gonna have to go through probably getting a different vaccine you know, every year. I'm sorry for that, but I think um, out of respect to Becky, who's been working at night, to my, my nurse had drive back from Oklahoma New Year's Eve. Uh, my ER director, Misty Bond, because we, didn't, we were short a nurse. I went in there New Year's Eve. Every ER room was full. Our med surge floor normally has 14 patients. It's averaged 18. I had to talk to a patient that was visiting here from Arizona over the holidays, came to see his family. What do you think happened? He got sick. Where'd he end up? Our hospital. Why? It's the only level three trauma center in Southeast Kansas unless you go over to Pittsburgh. And we're working very cooperatively with the other hospitals. We accepted some patients over the holidays from Fredonia. I know we accepted some from Wilson Medical. All the hospitals have tried to work together and put, it, put aside their competitiveness. We have to continue that to benefit you. And you should expect that from us. So please wash your hands. Please wear your mask. Please get vaccinated. If you don't want to, that's fine. We'll do the best we can to take care of you when you come in. But know that every hospital in Southeast Kansas is full. Um, Christmas Eve, there was not an ICU bed available between um, Missouri and I believe it was Arizona or Nevada. 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 So uh, it's, it's going to be a good year. Everything is going to be okay, but we have to work together and not judge, judge each other. So please do that. With that, I'm just going to say thank you, and uh, we, it's an honor to serve this community. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I, I must give Brian a shout out for the support, but I also want to give a couple of other shout outs at the Labette Health table, and that would be to um, Becky, because since the pandemic hit, um, David Cowan and the city staff um, have organized COVID calls that we've been on. There's probably 15 of us on what used to be a daily call, even in, on the weekends. And Becky always gave us a very informative um, report on that call and I know took a lot of time out of her busy schedule taking care of patients to be able to keep us all well informed. And even when she can't make the calls sometimes now, um, she still always emails David and gives an update on what's happening, and we appreciate that um, very much. So we know that you guys are working really, really hard. And also um, Anthony Vaughn, who serves on our board of directors and um, was recently asked by the executive committee to serve as vice chair of business and economic development. So we appreciate his time and commitment to um, and his leadership to the Chamber of Commerce. So again, thank you to Labette Health for your support and um, the medical care that you're providing to all of us. So thank you for that. Um, at this time, we usually give, the, give a few uh, minutes to look at the calendar, and we're still gonna do that, 
But this morning I got a text from our wonderful city manager um, who said that she was ready to give us a little bit of information. So I've given her the wireless mic and um, she has some really good information that she would like to share with all of us this morning. So would you please welcome our city manager, Kelly Passour. Thank you and, and good morning. And, and before I start, I just want to give a shout out to our employees. Um, like Brian uh, acknowledged, 2021 has been a rough year as far as recruiting and our employees' uh, departments getting hit. We've had 100% out on quarantine in some departments at times, and it's been, it's been quite challenging. And if you have comments or, or constructive tips to give us, I would appreciate it if you would call us rather than posting them on Facebook because we may not see them there. So <laughs> we do have a new uh, a phone system, and so it's a lot easier to reach us. And then, of course, you can reach out to us through our website. And, and uh, we want to make sure and address your concerns in a timely manner, so we need to see them. So we'd really appreciate that. Um, so I, what I have to tell you this morning, I think it's the worst-kept secret in Montgomery County. Um, we uh, finally got the go-ahead from um, FedEx to announce that they are the ones coming. Um, it is a $24 million project, 192,500-square-foot building. And as you can see, it is very well went underway with removing a lot of dirt. They poured some concrete and done all kinds of things. So we're really, really excited about this project. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we appreciate the coverage and the, the local papers that they've done. It's been great. And then we have another one coming up with uh, the uh, Precision Railway that we're hoping uh, we'll have more information on that coming in. So we just wanted to to officially, we are not under the NDA anymore. We can actually say it is FedEx. So <laughs> awesome. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Congratulations. You guys did a good job. And yeah, you can just keep it. And then um, also, Kelly, do you have some newsletters at the end that we can pass out? And they should be getting some in the mail. Is that right? Yes. The newsletters are going out in the mail today. And I will put some copies over there if you get a... a if you have city utility services, you will get one in the mail. And if not, I have some over there so that you will can pick them up. Awesome. Thank you. Hot off the press. And also, David and Kelly will be um, co-presenting next month and giving a, a, a detailed update on everything that's happening in the city. So be sure and show up February. Okay. I'm going to get us back on track real fast. I'm going to talk at mock speed, tell you what's going on, get your calendars out. They're full of really good information. If we miss something, we need to correct something. It has not been published yet, so be sure and get with me after first Friday, and we'll get it taken care of. There's Bulldog basketball tonight. Girls play at 6, boys play at 8. They're taking on the Parsons Vikings, and then they will take on Coffeeville next Friday, so don't miss out on that one. That's always a fun game when we do our, our county rivalry. Um, the collection day for recycling is tomorrow at the sanitation yard from 8 to noon. It's always the first Saturday of the month, so be sure and check that out. And they also accept recycling on Tuesdays from 11 to 1. If you need CPR training, there's going to be a training class this Saturday, and I don't know if it's too late to sign up, but if you need CPR training, you can reach out to Indy Saves and sign up for that, or you can email them at indysaves at gmail.com. Saturday, the Independence High School will host a wrestling tournament. This is a boys tournament, starts at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then there's actually girls wrestling now, and they will have a tournament on the 22nd. Um, there's a new veteran service program that's rolled out. Um, it's Mondays, and you're going to have a shout-out about that from Lauren Osborne, so hang around for more information. The museum has an exhibit going on, and Ray Rothgeb is here to do a shout-out about that. Pirate basketball is um, ready to start back up after the holidays. Next Wednesday, they take on Northwest Kansas Tech College. And on the 19th, Colby Community College. Those games, um, the women will tip off at 5 and the men will play at 7. And there's another home game on the 22nd. They'll take on Cloud County. So three home basketball games at the college. Um, if you're looking for some fun athletic entertainment, check out basketball. And when they do play Cloud County, I might point out on the 22nd, the games are at 2 and 4, so they're afternoon games. Dickies is still offering live music on Wednesday evening, so um, enjoy some barbecue and some really good music and support our restaurants in downtown. 
And um, the brewery also has mixtape bingo on Wednesdays and trivia night on Thursdays. If you drive by, they're always busy. So be sure and check that out as well. There's going to be some visitors in our community uh, about mid-month and then later in the month with some hunting events that are happening. Um, bird Hunters United National Championship is the 13th through the 16th. And these are bird hunters who have been competing all year long and earning points to be able to participate in this national championship. And then following BHU will be the National Upland Classic Kansas State Championship, and they call that NUX. And um, that organization is basically comprised of people who um, know and appreciate quality bird dogs. And they'll be out at Remington Ranch at the end of the month, January 28th through the 30th. Um, both of the events are at Remington Ranch. And actually, spectators are welcome. So if you want to get out and check it out, you are always welcome to head out there east of town. Um, we have a couple speakers that are going to be talking about the Martin Luther King Memorial Celebration. So we want um, to share the information about that event. Save the date for the 107th Annual Chamber Meeting and Banquet. It's the 25th of this month. So make sure that you call the office and make your reservations. Um, catering Resources, owned and operated by Brent and Dorothy Littleton, are catering this year. Brent is here this morning with us, so we're super excited to have him cater our event for the very first time. And he always has great food, so you know that's going to be a hit. But we need you to make your reservations, so please do that. And then I want to give a shout out because next Friday, um, Sonia and James Cantrell will be closing their jewelry store. They've been servicing the um, county for over 45 years. Actually, not the county, Southeast Kansas for over 45 years. James is the only certified master jeweler in the state of Kansas. Um, we're going to miss them dearly, um, but um, they have earned this retirement. And while we're going to miss them, um, we're going to be very, very excited for them to um, enjoy life and retirement and all that that brings. I think James is still going to be doing some custom work and some jewelry repair maybe um, in his home, so we'll still be able to tap into that resource. But the jewelry store in Coffeeville and Independence will um, be changing hands, and we've got some exciting news for that that we will share probably in the upcoming weeks. And so with that, there's information on our website. We always have this, the flyers on our website. It's on our Facebook page, Get Independence. Um, we publish it in the reporter in a, in a flyer that's called What's Up. There's a community calendar that we publish uh, or that we talk about on the radio, and it's actually sponsored by Dairy Queen. It's on My Country 102.9 and KIND 94.9. And then we do a live interview um, every Tuesday morning on KGGF 690. And it's during open line. Lots of listeners um, tune in to that, and then it's replayed um, many other times during the week. So I'm sure you can catch all that great information. Um, so... If we've missed anything, let us know. If you want us to shout out and publicize something, please let us know. But it's time for our speakers, and we have some really good ones this morning. Um, first up is a duo. Um, Charles Barker and Kathy Shepard are members of the um, Independence Chamber's Diversity Task Force. They're here to present about the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. community celebration. Please welcome Kathy and Charles. Good morning. Before I start telling you about everything we have planned for Independence's Martin Luther King Day celebration, I wanted to start with a quote from Dr. King and share some information about the importance of this celebration. The quote goes, the only normalcy that we will settle for is the normalcy of brotherhood, the normalcy of true peace, the normalcy of justice. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. devoted his life to equality, social justice, economic advancement, and opportunity for all. He challenged us to build a more perfect union and taught us that everyone has a role to play in making America what it ought to be. Together, we can create and sustain opportunities for Americans to strengthen their own communities um, <clears throat> by ensuring that more young people graduate from high school, by supporting our military families and veterans, by combating the opioid crisis, and helping communities prepare and recover from disasters. Together, we demonstrate what it means to be citizens. Dr. King recognized the power of service. He famously said, everyone be can be great 
because everyone can serve. Observing the Martin Luther King Jr. federal holiday through service is a way to begin each year with a commitment to making your community a better place. Your service honors Dr. King's life and teachings and helps meet community challenges. Service also brings people together of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities. The MLK Day of Service encourages all types of service, particularly projects that have a lasting impact and connect participants to ongoing service. I think after 2021, this is an important way to start 2022. On January 6th, we have a great program scheduled in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King. This program is something that our diversity task force has worked on throughout the year. If you've never been, it's a great program. I encourage you to come. This is not for a certain community here, it's for everyone. And if you've never been out there, you're missing out. It is a great program with lots of music, great speakers, and it is just a really good opportunity. Our service project, as always, is collecting food to restock the food pantry community access center here in town. So we encourage everybody, get your friends together, get your coworkers together, collect some food, and bring it on a Sunday, January the 16th at 3 p.m. to the high school. We'll collect that right before the program starts. And then um, we'll see, we call it our food fight, just a, a play on um, trying to make it more fun for the students in school to collect food, and they do a great job of it. Um, each year we're able to bring in thousands of pounds of food um, to Community Access Center, and it's always a great thing, a way to get together and help our community out. So I'm going to pass it off to Charles, and I'll let him tell you more specifically about our program and our speaker. Thank you. Good morning, all, and uh, certainly uh, thank you, Kathy, for um, that wonderful uh, intro to uh, what we have been uh, blessed to be a part of for um, a great number of years here in Independence. I think that you ought to be extremely proud of yourself uh, for having um, the ability to come together. This program uh, that we've uh, tried to be a part of for a great number of years have, has brought people together in a way that uh, is unparalleled. And uh, so we're excited uh, about the program. Uh, it starts at 3 o'clock, is that right, on uh, the 16th, uh, mon on Sunday. And uh, uh, we promise to get you out uh, before your favorite football game is over. Uh, uh, <laughs> isn't that funny? <laughs> But anyway, we got great people who are coming uh, um, uh, to be a part of the program. And I, I should let you know that, again, um, uh, Kathy uh, uh, made the a point that it's a uh, coming together uh, piece for all of us, and it has been that way from the very onset. Uh, so come out. We have a, a gentleman who will be the speaker uh, who is actually, Brian was talking about uh, cooperation and coming together, who is actually the county attorney for uh, Neosho County and uh, a veteran uh, in his own right. He has served 32 years uh, in the Kansas uh, National Guard. Uh, and so uh, just uh, understanding how important it is for us to continue to come together. Um, the Diversity Task Force, uh, one of the things that we've mentioned, and I see some of the members um, spread abroad in here even now, but one of the things that we've always said is that we are better together. Uh, and uh, we have a group of uh, ministers who continue from our community to rotate and be a part of this. And uh, just a wonderful time for us to uh, come together. I think the th uh, this year's theme is um, uh, K King's vision, it starts with me. Shifting priorities to create the beloved community. And that's what it's all about. We've been, uh, again, privileged to have that kind of community here in Independence, and uh, uh, let's continue to work together uh, uh, in 2022. Thank you.
And I must echo, if you've never been, you are missing out. You really should. Put that on your calendar and try to attend. Not only is it great music and great speakers and great fellowship, but they also give the Spirit of Unity Award. And it's um, very impactful and very moving. And the individuals who are always recognized are so deserving um, for that honor. And I must say that yesterday was um, a year ago that we lost our Spirit of Unity Award winner, um, Jerry Bright. And so while he's very much missed by all of us, um, he's constantly being thought of, uh, especially when we talk about our Spirit of Unity Award winners and we're able to um, think back about those people that we have honored in the past for those special awards. Our next speaker is kind of a new face, maybe, to some of you. Scott Patton is the director of our wonderful Riverside Park and Ralph Mitchell Zoo. But I met Scott when he worked out at Elk City State Park, actually. Um, very involved, was actually one of our tour guides um, in his leadership role out there when we brought our first leadership kids out for a tour of the um, state park and um, did such a, a good job because he really... Uh, meshed well with the youth on the bus that day. I remember that. And so I was really excited when I found out that he applied and even more excited when I found out that he was given the job. So would you please welcome our new park and zoo director, Scott Patton. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning. Um, as Lisa said, my name is Scott Patton. I'm the director of Riverside Park, Ralph Mitchell Zoo in Mount Hope Cemetery, affectionately referred to as the new Barb. <laughs> I received my bachelor's degree in park management and conservation from Kansas State University in 2016. In 2019, my wife and I moved to Independence after I accepted a position with KDWP as park ranger at Elk City State Park. In July of 2021, after two and a half years with KDWP, I accepted my current position with the City of Independence. In my six months as director, I have had the pleasure of working with the dedicated staff at the park, zoo, and cemetery, as well as other city departments. In addition, I have enjoyed the opportunity to get to know many members of the community and look forward to continuing to develop these relationships for years to come. Today, I'll be discussing ongoing projects at Riverside Park and Ralph Mitchell Zoo. The City of Independence is currently under contract with PGAV Architects, a firm out of Kansas City, to develop a master plan that will lay out all projects in Ralph Mitchell Zoo for the next 30 years. The plan will adjust most of the layout of the zoo and will be designed with the overall goal of attaining accreditation from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, otherwise known as AZA. There are numerous benefits to obtaining AZA accreditation. These include increasing eligibility for funding and grants from certain foundations, corporations, and other sources, promoting professional relationships with other AZA accredited zoos in the United States, providing impartial periodic evaluation by professional experts, promoting excellence within the institution by encouraging constant self-evaluation, providing zoo staff an invaluable opportunity to learn from other institutions, fostering staff and community pride, significantly improving the ability to attract and retain a high quality professional staff, allowing participation in animal exchange, in other words, access to specimens from other AZA accredited zoos and aquariums for loan or breeding, providing opportunities for collaboration and consultation with AZA colleagues who are top experts in their fields, and offering participation in the AZA Reciprocal Zoo Program, which would grant members of Four Paws discounted or free entry to other AZA accredited zoos. The master plan will include the following projects. A new ADA compliant sidewalk plan will be designed to conform to, to, conform to the new layout of the zoo, this plan will include providing ADA access to the ravine where the bear, cougar, and eagle exhibits are currently located. Utilities will be upgraded to provide reliable access for all zoo and park facilities. This will include a new lighting plan for the park and zoo as well as installation of new security systems. 
A new facility will, will be constructed to replace the current Stevens Building, which will include improved commissary and veterinary facilities, food storage, and improved indoor enclosures that will allow animals to be viewable by zoo visitors year-round. A new educational center will be constructed, which will provide space for rotating interpretive exhibits, as well as indoor space for educational programs, a gift shop, and office space for zoo staff. A new indoor space will be constructed for the bear and cougar exhibits, which will allow them to be viewable by zoo visitors during the off season and during inclement weather. As one of the most historically significant structures in independence, the integrity of Monkey Island will be preserved. Some work will be necessary to expand the castle and provide adequate indoor space for the monkeys. The duck pond is another historically significant structure and goes hand in hand with Monkey Island. The stone walls in the duck pond have become severely degraded and are on the verge of collapse. The pond is also too shallow to operate the fountains, which has caused an issue with water quality. The pond will be drained, dug out, and restored to working order. The walls will be repaired or rebuilt to keep the same aesthetic. Current exhibits will be expanded to provide animals additional space. Additional exhibits will also be constructed to expand the zoo's collection of animals. New interactive play features will be placed in certain areas of the zoo, including kitty land. The initial round of plenary meetings between city staff and PGAV were conducted at the end of November, and we are looking forward to the next phase of development for the zoo master plan. The plan is anticipated to be completed in summer of 2022. Other projects currently underway at Riverside Park and Ralph Mitchell Zoo include a new ADA sidewalk plan that is currently under construction in Kitty Land. These upgrades will include construction of a new ramp to provide ADA access to the castle and a new lighting plan which has been sponsored by Independence Lions Club. Construction is also scheduled to begin on a single family restroom facility that will be placed on the north side of Kitty Land. This will include installation of an ADA drinking fountain. Outdated playground equipment has been removed from Kitty Land. Replacement play systems will be included in the zoo master plan and will be a joint project between Independence Lions Club and the City of Independence. The City is currently requesting proposals for engineering services regarding the design of a plan for the future upgrade of electrical service to Riverside Park and Ralph Mitchell Zoo. Electrical service to the park and zoo is currently outdated and unreliable. The city currently owns and is responsible for electrical service north of Oak Street in the Park and Zoo. Plans will include design of new service to Park and Zoo buildings and an updated lighting plan. After electrical service has been upgraded, Evergy will take ownership. The electrical upgrade plan will be developed in conjunction with the Zoo Master Plan. A project is also currently being planned for restoration of the ATN SF 1050 steam locomotive in Riverside Park. This locomotive is historically significant in the fact that it was the first of 103 1050 class prairie type steam locomotives manufactured by Baldwin in 1902. This locomotive was an active passenger train until 1955 when it was donated to the City of Independence by Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad. Since that time, it has been a popular attraction for parks visitors to climb into the cab of the locomotive and take photos. Over the past 66 years, however, the train has deteriorated to the point that it is no longer safe for visitors to climb. In order to ensure future generations continued access to the locomotive, a restoration project must be completed. The plan will include repairing the deteriorated areas of the locomotive and providing a fresh coat of paint with a protective finish to restore the aesthetic and prevent future deterioration. This project is still in the planning process. In closing, I would like to express gratitude to those who have played a part in making Riverside Park, Ralph Mitchell Zoo, and Mount Hope Cemetery the crown jewel that they are. I look forward to playing a part in continuing the tradition of keeping these hidden gems a source of community, community pride for years to come. Holy smokes, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Barb left Barb left it in, uh, yeah, or got it all ready for you and passed it off in good shape, and she's sitting back there going, whew, I don't have to do that. I saw that look on your face.
But we are so appreciative of of all the, the city's commitment to the park and the zoo, all the years of service that Barb and her staff put into that, and we look forward to um, your leadership, Scott, out in the park and the, and the zoo and the beautiful cemetery. Um, we're so fortunate to have a cemetery as beautiful as the one that we have, and it's so well kept. So um, we get a lot of comments about that at the chamber office, so we're very appreciative of everybody who works hard out there as well. There's like 123 or some odd acres at the park and the zoo, so you got a big job with lots of things on that to-do list. All right. Our next set of speakers is a trio, so we started with a duo, and we're going to uh, interject with a, a trio. Um, Jessica Letty, did I say your last name correct? Okay. Jessica Letty is actually um, one of our members of the Leadership Independence class this year, so um, this is a power-packed class of 18 um, up-and-coming leaders. We're excited to turn them loose into the community and watch what they're going to do to put their mark on independence. Um, but this morning she is here as um, part of her job and she's going to share with us about Hannah's House Ministries and she's brought a couple of extra individuals with her that are going to be giving some testimonials as well. So would you please welcome Jessica Levy. Letty. Hello. Yes, um, my name's Jessica. I'm the program director at the Hannah's House. <sighs> um, I'm also a licensed addictions counselor. So um, I um, went back to school a few years ago and I got that. And um, I also come from, um, I have about six years of experience in um, women's treatment centers before I was at the Hannah's House working in working with women who were um, in rehab. So I'm so excited to be here today. Um, thank you for letting us come and share today. Um, I know Hannah's House um, is really thankful to the community for the support that, uh, that we have from you guys. Um, without you guys, we wouldn't be able to operate and help the people that we help. So um, thank you for that. Um, what I wanted to share today was just kind of tell you guys about the program, what we do, um, how things work, um, what, and also let you guys know how you would get somebody connected with us that you might run into that needs some help. Um, so Hannah's House was, it opened nine years ago, um, and we've been able to um, help around 800 people since we've opened. And the founder of Hannah's House is actually here. His name's Pastor Dick Drummler. He's over here. Um, and he's not only my boss, but he's my spiritual father, and he's really amazing, and so um, I just want to honor him. Um, but um, Hannah's house was um, named after their fourth child, um, and she was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. Um, she passed away in 2001, and her life touched many. And as a memory to her, they um, decided to name this ministry after her. And I'm actually the same age as Hannah. <laughs> so, um, okay, I'm going to try to keep my emotions in check. <laughs> um, so the mission of Hannah's House is to provide peace in the midst of the storm. Um, it also, we, we believe in the power of one relationship at a time. Um, so, and we also provide hope for the homeless. Right now we're serving, um, we have 10 men um, that we serve um, in that um, when Hannah's house first opened, it was only for, it was only for women. Um, and what happened, dad tells this story better than I do, but uh, he uh, was the pastor at Crystal Brook Church, and um, he would have women come, and they would be addicted, and they would be homeless, and they'd sometimes have children, and he just wasn't able, he'd, he'd get them a hotel room for the night, um, and get them a cheeseburger, um, here in Independence, Kansas, but he just felt that that wasn't enough to, because he said that the next day they would be right in the same situation they were before. So um, that's kind of the heart of Hannah's house is um, just helping one relationship at a time. And so um, because of that dream and that vision that was placed in, in Pastor Dick, um, he um, ended up buying a house right across the street from from the church, and, um, and that's how Hannah's house got birthed. Um, but in the beginning, it was just women until a few years ago. Um, 
it, we opened up to men as well, and uh, Jamie's going to talk more about that. Um, we also have two reintegration houses right now. So we, we not only have, we have room for 10 men and eight women right now, but we also have, once they complete the first phase of um, our program, then they move to reintegration. And we also have few houses, um, more than one houses, homes there that um, here in the community where they um, start to get reintegrated in the community, they start to get a job, they start working, um, but they also stay connected to our programs and our different services that we offer. Um, it's a Christ-centered ministry. It's established to bring health, healing, and hope by breaking the chains of addiction. Um, and the vision is to provide services that will take people from unstable circumstances to stability. Um, so how things work, um, so kind of the schedule, what a normal day looks like for a resident at Hannah's house is they, they wake up at 7, um, they eat breakfast, they do chores, they write daily devotionals, um, and then we have chapel two times a day where people from the community come in and they teach. Um, we have um, pastors, different teachers, different, um, um, different ones from the community that come in and teach our, teach our residents, which we're really grateful for that we have that support. Um, and then they do personal studies. We do have a curriculum that we do, and it's um, Christ-centered. Um, so it's um, basically about getting a solid foundation in Jesus. Um, we also get them connected to um, addiction-specific treatment at Fort County. We're really grateful to Fort County because um, they offer a more specific um, addictions treatment, which is, which is important. So we get them connected to those resources as well. They can do outpatient therapy while they're with us, which, which is important um, to address the addiction issues, as well as getting a solid foundation and stability in our program. So... Um, and then we also um, go to 12-step meetings in the community. We go to celebrate recovery. Um, we do different things in the evening. We like to keep them busy because we know that downtime is, is not good for somebody that's um, learning a new way of life. So um, we try our best to keep them busy. Um, and so they have a full day. They're going from, from 7 o'clock in the morning until um, in the evening time. Uh, so um, we do have, the, so the first, the, the Hannah House program is all in all, it's 10 to 12 months because um, we like you to do the first four months. It's pretty high intensity, um, pretty um, supervised. Um, but the first four months that they're with us, that's the phase one where they're um, doing the things I talked about. And then after the four months, they graduate into our reintegration program. And we like them to stay there at least six months so that they have um, a good, um, a good base so they can go out in the community and be successful people that don't have to struggle with the things that they've struggled with before. Um, so yes, um, to, end, um, to end, I would like to say that uh, to get somebody connected with us, we do have, um, an on, we do have a website. So if you guys want to get on there, um, it's hannashouseks.com. I do have brochures over there. Um, and it has all of our information on it. So our phone number is on there. You can reach me. My office is at Crystal Brook Church. Just ask for me. Um, I'm there during business hours, and I can help however I can help. Um, the brochures have some more information on it, but the, there is an application process. And so the applications are posted online, so you can... Um, Look at, look at the application and then have the person fill it out and email it to us and then we will get them in. Sometimes there is a waiting list just because of the need. We have people not only from this community but other communities that have heard about us that bring in, that bring in people that need help and, and need um, freedom from addiction. So, um, so yes, um, any questions, just let me know I'm available. And I'm going to let Jamie and uh, Michael come up and share. How y'all doing? Okay, so um, I'm going to stick to what I have written because I'm like my dad. I'm like Pastor Dick. If I talk, it won't ever end. So, so, <laughs> so I'm just going to stick to what I wrote. Um, so first off, I want to say thank you to Independence, uh, the community. Uh, I love this city. I love living here. I love the Labette Health, what you guys have done in the community. It's amazing. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and to the EMS and everybody in this area, I, I thank you um, to the city. Uh, first, I want to start off by saying 
that uh, my name is Jamie Hoggett. I'm a 40-year-old native of Coffeyville, Kansas. I had a 22-year active IV methamphetamine addiction. Very, very active. Very, very serious. Very, very bad. Uh, I moved to southeast Kansas from Texas. I was homeless, and I was very addicted. In 2015, I had the opportunity to meet Pastor Dick Drummiller, a pioneer in the apostolic movement of SEK. This, this man is amazing and the things that he does for this community, not just for the church. I arrived at Crystal Brook Church and immediately felt the love of God. Pastor Dick, who I, by the way, now call Dad, that's my dad, had not known me but for maybe one day and gave me a home to live in. The day we met, he got me a hotel room. I remember when he picked me up from the hotel the next morning to take me to the church and hearing a voice inside my heart saying, you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. He explained to me that there was no men's program, that it was a women's crisis facility. They helped women and mothers in need, but God had a plan. The enemy tried to use my brokenness as evil, but God used it for good. He went on to tell me of a house they had on Locust Street that was empty. The water, the gas, and the electricity was on, and that I could live there as long as I submitted to God and the program and came and participated in everything, so I did. I was the first man in the program. I went from homelessness to homebound in a moment, and I experienced true fatherly love. I was living in an alleyway here in our great city, on a cardboard box between two dumpsters, lost and broken, not only by the influence of others, but also by the consequences of my decisions. It hasn't been perfect, but it has, it has worked through time. I grew to be the person you see before you today, someone who can hold their head up high, someone who can honestly say he loves you, and not superficial love that man has created, but love you as a brother should love his kin, like family. I am completely changed. I'm here to express to you the importance of Hannah's House program, not only in my life, but in the lives of many, many others, maybe even your neighbors, maybe even you. The program is the presence of God. It has a geographical location at Hannah's House, but holds no boundaries as far as the community is concerned. Thank you and God bless. Hi, my name is Michael Phillips. I'm uh, 37 years old from Anderson, South Carolina. Um, came from a good family. Uh, church didn't know Jesus Christ at the beginning. And uh, early on in my youth, I dealt with a lot of self-esteem, low self-esteem, depression. And around the age of 16, I started self-medicating with drugs and alcohol um, by around the age 30. I had uh, become a full-blown IV drug addict, pushed away every relationship I'd had. But um, in a last-ditch effort, my parents had heard about the Hannah House Project, asked me if I would give it a shot, and I did. And since then, I have been, um, I've been saved. It saved my life completely. I've accepted Jesus Christ into my heart, um, been rebaptized, started counseling sessions through the program, um, completely turned my life around, uh, rebuilding relationships with my family and myself. Um, it's just it's a very special place for me here. Um, it's saved my life, and I want to thank the community for everything they've done for us here, uh, allowing it to be around. And But um, the tools I've learned from this program will keep me from going back out into the world and becoming what I was. Um, oh, yes, something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just want to thank the community for everything they've done. Well, congratulations to both of you. That's awesome, and thank you, Jessica, for everything that you're doing, and thank you, Dick, for everything that you continue to do through Crystal Brook. Um, wow. 
you're definitely changing lives and we couldn't be more happy to have you in our community and um, uh, we wish you all the best and that's what's wonderful about independence is that hopefully you feel the love of everybody in our community and um, we hope you hang around stay here and and um, and continue to give back so what a what a testimony and I know that that may or may not be difficult to get up in front of complete strangers and, and tell that story. But um, I've heard Hannah's house give testimonials one other time at Celebrate Independence. And I guarantee you, um, I think we videotaped it. There was not a dry eye in the room. It was so impactful. And I remember it. It was probably four or five years ago. Um, but congratulations on the good job. And we appreciate your um, commitment to our community, both you and Lisa, and the things that you do through your your church. So, good job. Um, wow, Trisha. How are you going to top all of that stuff that's been going on? So, okay, no, 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 no. We know you've got good information. Trisha Purden from the Office of Rural Prosperity is here. Um, I always like to invite her to the podium about once a quarter so that she can give us an update on um, economic development and all the good things that are happening at the state of Kansas. So please welcome Trisha Purden. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for having me back, Lisa. Um, yeah, I, I can't talk that. <laughs> um, but I will say that it's been a pleasure. Uh, I think it's been seven months, eight months-ish since I've been at the Office of Rural Prosperity at the Kansas Department of Commerce, and it's been a pleasure. Um, it really has made it so that everything we were doing here at Montgomery County now, we can take and, and do across the whole state of Kansas, which has been really fun, really exciting, and um, we've got some some fun stuff in the hopper. So um, economic development, I can't top Kelly. I can't top the last group either. Um, but I will say that we're doing some really great stuff. The first big thing that we took on at the Office of Rural Prosperity was housing. Uh, we did a tour in 2019. I think I talked to you guys about this last time um, to really focus in on what the needs were across the state of Kansas. We had a session here in Independence even in 2019. Housing for two years came across as the number one thing. And I think all of us knew that, right? So um, we just finished about a week ago uh, the complete housing study for the state of Kansas. Uh, this study did a full analysis down to parcel data um, across the entire state, which was a monumental task. It took about a year to complete. Um, but they even went through and they worked with our county appraisers across the state. They worked with the census data that was coming out that we received this fall. And they incorporated this all into this excellent report that says exactly strategies, goals that we need to be setting, um, programs that we could be implementing, strategies that we're seeing across the United States of things that are working well when in a rural community that are trying to build new houses, rehab houses, and things like that. So. Um, I'm going to give you some quick highlights of what that report came out with, and then I'm going to talk about some of the other cool stuff we have going on. The first thing I will say, moderate income housing, workforce housing is number one. And that came out in almost every single city in the entire state of Kansas said they needed workforce housing. And that's from Overland Park down to Elkhart, Kansas. Every single community said that this is a need. If we don't have workforce housing, the state of Kansas cannot grow its workforce. We cannot grow jobs. Um, and this especially comes at the time when we set a state record this last year in economic development projects, and we end up hitting $3.7 billion in new capital investment by businesses in the state. So that's a lot of new jobs that are coming to the state of Kansas. If we don't have houses for those people to live in, those projects may or may not come to fruition. And so we have a big carrot and we can bring them to the state of Kansas, but if there's no place for them to live, you don't see that return on our investment for taxpayers across the state. So one of the big things is let's increase the funding to moderate income housing program. KHRC has a great program. Crazy enough, I you know, you take it, you think from the state of Kansas, you don't realize that we're doing really great stuff sometimes. Kansans are really bad about tooting our own horn and shouting from the rooftops how great we're already doing. And apparently, all the other states in, in the United States have been trying to copy 
Kansas's program for moderate income housing. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I think right now they're getting about $2 million a year. Every single year they get about five to $7 million worth of requests. And so clearly there's a need for that moderate income housing and workforce housing. So there's got to be a way that we bridge that gap. Um, the other piece of that is tax credits. Um, other states are doing this. Nebraska's doing this. Iowa's doing this. Um, I think even Oklahoma implemented this last year. But if, if anyone's tried to rehab a building or build a new building, how many times have you seen, oh, well, I can build this building or this house for $150,000, but it's not going to appraise out at $150,000. It's going to come in at $110,000 or $120,000 because no new houses have been built in the community for so long that there's no comps for our realtors to compare it to and to actually give it a, a, a good appraisal. So this is one of the things that this tax credit would do, would help bridge that gap for our um, builders that are building new houses, that are building these moderate income houses to help cover that distance between the two uh, amounts. So they can actually sell the house for what they have in it, uh, maybe make enough of a profit that they can build another house and keep this cycle going and build more houses across the state of Kansas. Um, I mean, I heard that from developers here in Montgomery County. They said that, yeah, tell me. Let me, tell, let me know where I can build new houses, but can you guarantee that I'm not going to take a 20% loss at the end of this project? And if you take a 20% loss on one house, you're definitely not building another one. So um, we've seen some really great stuff. Actually, uh, when we were talking about this program, I said, well, Independence already did this um, in a different form or fashion. We did a, they did a grant a few years ago for moderate income housing. Um, so shout out to April Nutt, who really has been a pioneer on that. Um, the other piece of this is, and, and if, if you've ever looked back at when large swaths of our housing have been built, I think it would be a really interesting study to see when you see a whole neighborhood being built, if it came at the same time as a large economic development project, a large industry coming to town or a large expansion, I've seen that when I was going back and looking some of the historical data um, in Montgomery County, where you see several houses that were built at a period when we got a new industry, um, like Aptis. Um, some of those older industries that have been here for generations built houses when they came. So this was the concept that they came up with um, as part of the study of let's tweak the state incentives that we already have, that incentivize them, get cash to businesses to help them grow their business. Let's also allow them to take advantage of those same programs, the tax credits, for building housing. So right now, if they put money into the building and they add new equipment and they spend money into their business, they get a tax credit if they pay their employees a really good wage. Why not do the same thing? If they pay their employees a good wage and they invest in housing instead of just their business and they add a new development, then they can get the same tax credit for that equal amount of capital investment into the community. It addresses their workforce shortage, that we have a massive work workforce shortage in the state of Kansas, and addresses our housing shortage at the same time. And it adds property to our communities that we are all badly needing. So that's one of the, the exciting programs that, that they... Um, that they submitted for us to review. And I see we have Senator Peck here in the room, so hopefully he'll take this back to the legislators and, and talk about some of these programs. It's going to be a big lift this year, I will say. And I'm new. I'm hoping that we can, we can do all of this. But I would say there's about 10 different things that they submitted in this study that said the legislature needs to take these, the state uh, of Kansas needs to take these, KHRC needs to take these, um, but altogether, I think there were 30 or 40 recommendations between those three groups that need to, pay, need to take them on. There's also a great section for local. So, uh, Kelly, you might want to take a look at this report, or April, look at the report. There are some great things in there that actually I took and April took to the committee and said, there's some really amazing innovative programs happening across the state of Kansas to rehab existing housing. Um, the neighborhood grant program that Independence has, for example, where if you have, I think it's like three different houses can join together and say, we're going to fix up our house. You can get a matching grant for those dollars to fix up. And so your whole neighborhood gets improved because if you improve one house, but the other house still looks like a shack and no one's investing money into that building, your property appraisal is not going to go up. It's not really going to do a whole lot to help the neighborhood as a whole. So how do we do this together? Um, the other last piece I want to say that there's a really cool program to also help cover that appraisal gap. 
and that's it's actually at the federal level currently I think it's in the build back better act um, but if that passes great but if not the state of Kansas should be looking at something called the neighborhood homes investment act it's basically a tax credit um, to cover that appraisal gap too, but it would do it uniformly across the state of Kansas. And it makes it a little easier, especially for the really small towns to take advantage of it. If they don't have a large industrial indust you know, project that has HPIP or credits or something like that, like I'll use Elkhart, Kansas as, as an example again, a town of that size probably is never gonna get a, you know, a brand new John Deere facility coming to their town. So how can they also build new houses? Okay, the last piece I'll say is the building trade shortage. We can say that we need houses and we can have a developer that wants to build houses, but if we don't actually have workers that can build the houses, we're still nowhere. Um, so this is gonna be something that we're gonna be working with the Kansas Board of Regents on, looking at ways to alleviate the building trade shortage that we have across the state of Kansas, working with our community colleges, working with our trade schools and working with our universities um, to improve the, um, programs that are available to folks that want to go into the building trades. My own son tells me every day he wants to be a construction worker and he runs around the house with his construction worker hat on the hat and his like tool belt. And, and at first I, I initially had a pause. I'm like, well, you know, I want you to be an engineer or something like your father. And then I realized, well, geez, Mr. Crossland makes a really nice salary too. Um, I should be pushing him harder to do, go into building trades because it's a great profession. And for everyone in the room should be doing the same thing. Um, there are amazing jobs out there that you could make a heck of a lot more than I ever did with my master's degree, and you don't have to go and spend $100,000 at a university to do it. Um, building trades are an amazing career path for folks, and if we're not pushing our, our kids and our students into that field, again, we're never going to see our towns grow. So um, it's a critical linchpin that the state of Kansas has to address. Okay, off of housing. Um, but I'll stay on legislature a little bit. One of the things that we did last year, and it was all thanks to Representative Jim Kelly, um, they extended the Rural Opportunity Zone program. If you don't know what Rural Opportunity Zone program, program is, it's a program that incentivizes folks to move from out of, the, out of the state or from an urban area to a rural area. We've already seen some of this happening because of COVID. People are getting away from the cities. But this is one of the things that are, we never shouted it from the rooftops. We never advertised in New York City that you can come to rural Kansas and live a better quality of life with wide open spaces and a great air quality and um, have an amazing life here in a rural community. We were pretty bad about advertising this program. It'll pay up to $15,000 of student loan debt. It will give you a personal state income tax credit for five years if you come to the state. These are great programs that we take advantage of. And in fact, I think Montgomery County is the top user of that tax credit program in the state of Kansas. However, it was, a, it was going to expire last year. Jim got it extended and his committee and everyone at the legislature and the Senate, so thank you so much. Um, but now we need to tweak it. We need to bridge that gap with housing too. So one of the things that we did of, we might have these folks that have building trades programs and are, are electricians. Maybe they don't want to leave their town and they want to stay in their community and open their business and grow their business. How do we keep them in our communities? Well, what if we also did a, a program, instead of student loan forgiveness, we did a down payment assistance to help them buy their own home or help them invest in their own business and start up a business, especially if they're in building trades. So some, these are some of the programs we're gonna be talking about this year, um, probably bringing it in front of the legislature, but there's some really innovative ideas that came out of this housing study, but have also come out of some committees that have worked really hard for two years to tweak this program to make it um, a little bit more equitable and usable for everyone in the state of Kansas. Okay, Grassroots ED 101 is one of the other really cool programs we rolled out. We kicked that off in November. Basically what happened is I realized that I'm one person and I, took, I, be, I went from being really busy in just Montgomery County to covering 101 counties in the, in the state of Kansas. Um, and there's a staff of two at the Office of Rural Prosperity. Um, that's not gonna cut it. And so we quickly realized that we need to grow capacity in every community in the state of Kansas to be able to tackle housing and childcare and workforce challenges, infrastructure challenges in their community. And Myself and Sarah could not do it alone. So we created this program to do basic economic development 101. And it's not just economic development, but that's the way I can frame it um, to make it as easy to understand as possible. But we're doing deep dives in how do you develop new housing? 
How do you tackle childcare issues? How do you work together on a team to bring in your foundation and other area foundations to actually build a funding stack to address a massive issue you have in your community? So we had an example this last week with Norton, Kansas, a teeny tiny town in Northwest Kansas that worked together with their foundation, their economic development partners, their chamber, their tourism division to create several programs that have suddenly turned their community around. And this tiny town that had consistently been going down in population now has a population increase according to the new census data. So you can make a change, even if your population's 500 people, if you work together as a team. And independence does this exceedingly well, but there are things that we can do to, to make this even better. Um, so we're trying to get this information out there so everyone can be trained. We grow capacity across the state of Kansas, and it's not just the big dogs that are getting all the economic development projects, but we have small businesses that now have a person that they can talk to, can help them walk them through these programs. So um, we have 200 people who are registered so far, so, and they're from all over the state. We've covered all, the four, all four corners of our state. Um, but they're also all going to be permanently posted on the Office of Rural Prosperity's website so that anyone who wants to better understand how to open a child care facility, anyone who wants to understand how to build new houses in a community can go to these websites or to our website and watch these webinars and learn and then get the contact information for those folks who can help them. So this is not just a one-time thing. This is going to be ongoing, which we're excited about. All right. Last two things I'm going to have because I'm sure I'm probably running out of time. Um, we're really excited. We rolled out a mural program, and we're going to be doing that again. So if anyone is interested in working on murals in your community, um, we are going to be doing another grant cycle. It's probably going to be in April, so heads up for that. Um, we funded five uh, murals this time. I think we're going to try to fund 10 this year just from my budget. Um, but we're working together with the Kansas Creative Arts in KCAIC Commission, <laughs> I always forget what their <laughs> acronym is, um, but we're working with them and as well as community development and Kansas Main Street to do as many of these murals as we possibly can across the state. It really energizes folks. It gets people together on a shared vision. And the theme that we did was strength and resiliency of a community. And so we brought groups together that, uh, that we funded uh, one was a tribal nation in their community, and how do we? they work together, and they've gotten through some of the challenges that they faced working with their tribal nations and their community and working uh, to grow their population. Um, so there's some really cool stuff that we're seeing across the state on that. And then lastly, we'll say is not just myself and Sarah anymore. We finally got some staff. Um, I, we introduced a brand new person they started last Monday, Carrie Filetti. Um, she came to us from Cowley County, and she'll still be working remotely for the most part, but she'll also be working here in our independence office um, a couple times a month. So um, excited to join her. She's been doing this even longer than I have, so I'm pretty excited to have someone with so much expertise uh, coming to the Office of Real Prosperity. But um, she's going to be our grassroots strategy developer, um, which stands, the abbreviation is GSD, which stands for Getting Stuff Done. <laughs> Um, that came from us from Kansas Sampler Foundation who said that ORP needs someone who can literally just go out and boots on the ground, help communities get projects done. Um, again, it's just the two of us, so now we have three of us, and that's her job is just literally go out into a community, and when you have a challenge, she'll help you tackle it. So with that, I will wrap it up, but thank you all so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be back, um, and I'll join you guys next quarter to talk about more stuff that's going on happening in rural Kansas. Thanks. Thank you. I always appreciate you and your willingness to come and share with us, bring us up to speed with what's happening. It's time for our shout outs. The individuals know who they are, so they're making their way up front. I think we've got about four of them. And then um, I've got a few other announcements as we wrap it up. So first up is Ray. Thank you. The Independence Historical Museum and Arts Center is brought to you the exhibition Climate and Energy Central. It is in the IMAC gallery. It is free. It is not an exhibit of artifacts. It's an exhibit of information uh, dealing with uh, challenges of renewable en energy and potential climate change. And it's done through four themes, uh, through research in uh, uh, agriculture, climate science, energy, and Native American traditions. Two events will be featured during the exhibition, which closes on February 26th. 
Dr. Isaiah McCaffrey on January 15th gives a uh, discussion of environmental history of Montgomery County. And Rex Buchanan will be here on February 19th talking about water energy and uh, rural Kansas. I'd like to um, particularly express our gratitude and announce to you our sponsors that's made this possible, John and Stephanie Krasowski, Freedom's Frontier, the Chamber and CVB, uh, First Oak Bank, Community National Bank, and ICTC Faculty Association. You can see our entire calendar of events for 2022 if you go to ihmac.org. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Taylor with the Independence Lions Club, and 2022 is our 100th anniversary of being a club in town. We are, th yes, thank you. Thank you. We're uh, excited about what's happening in Independence, especially with our club this year. We need you. If you are interested in finding a place to be in the community for our many projects that we do, or if you just want to come to our dinner programs and just sit around and hear what's going on and burp afterwards, uh, <laughs> we have membership forms over here on our table. Uh, we are waiving our initiation fees for the first six months of this year, so you might be able to save some money. Real quick, uh, changing hats here, I'll be very brief. Go buy a copy of the Montgomery County Chronicle this week and read the story on page one about what is happening in Montgomery County in 2022. The size and scope of new construction and development is historic, in excess of over a half billion dollars is expected this year. A half billion with a B. That's never, ever, ever happened and may never happen again. I cannot wait next January to come back here mm -hmm. and say, look what's happened. And hopefully there will be a major hospital construction program then. But until then, FedEx, Soybean Processing Center, Coffeeville Re um, Resources has a huge project going on down there, plus street projects galore across the county, half billion dollars. I cannot wait to see what's going to happen in this county this year. Buy my newspaper. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Lauren Osborne. A lot of you probably don't know me. A few of you might. Uh, October 17th last year, we threw down our hat in the ring at the uh, county commissioners and said, we need an official veteran services program in Independence and for Montgomery County that takes care of not only connection with VA resources, but resources in the community and brings more veterans into our area because a lot of those tax-free dollars that they spend go back into areas where taxation can be acquired and reutilized in the community. Well, uh, the county didn't pick up that gauntlet, but for county mental health did. And over the course of the last year, we've built a program that we're launching right now. Mondays from 8.30 to 4.30 at the main building, we have veteran services. And February 16th, we go live five days a week at the north building on Donald Street. We not only work with veteran services and the VA, and we have a memorandum of understanding with the VA, but we also work with area community resources to help wrap services around veterans and bring them to the area, and we've already seen success in that. We're looking for community partners that are willing to work with us to help provide those services, and they don't necessarily have to be in a veteran services venue to do so. So a Southeast Kansas Veterans Provider Coalition is forming with area providers everywhere from car dealers all the way up to hospitals and stuff. So if you're interested in that, get with me a little bit later or make an appointment to come see me at my office after February 16th at the North Building. Uh, there are flyers over there with phone number on them, and thank you very much. Thank you. We can give it to Tabitha. Thank you, Lauren, very much. Good morning, uh, Tabitha with Independence Main Street. And first off, I just want to thank you all for, in 2021, you put local first, and our sales tax showed that, which, were we 5% up, Kelly, over over the year. So that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that being said, as you know, January and February can be a little slow. Um, it is a breather time for our retailers, but it's also a time where it is slow downtown. So on February 17th, and I told um, Lisa wrong, I think it's on the 18th on the calendar, but we'll get it changed to the 17th. At the it's a Thursday night. February 17th will be our Let's Wine About Winter, and so it's a time to get downtown and do a little shopping. We will be kicking it off with a free wine glass at Apricot Lane that night, so 
it's a time to give our retailers something to look forward to in February when it's a little bit of slower month. So we'll see you then. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Very appropriate to whine about winter right now. All right, so on behalf of the chamber, I want to thank you all for coming out, braving the weather. I want to thank um, our speakers. You all did such a nice job. The new Barb, Scott Patton, did a great job. I look forward to the Martin Luther King celebration. I encourage everyone to bring canned food items and mark your calendar for that on the 16th. And um, Jessica, thank you so much for all the things that you are doing to make a difference in the lives of others at the Hannah's house. And congratulations to um, Jamie and Michael on um, your life-changing experiences, and we wish you both the best. You did a great job this morning, and Tricia, thank you for carving time out of your, your um, very busy job to come to Montgomery County and Independence and share with us information from the state of Kansas. We appreciate that. Um, we do want to make sure that you don't walk away without your swag from Labette Health. So they gave you that hand sanitizer, and everybody better use it, like Brian said, so that we stay healthy. Um, but on top of that, you all have a nice insulated coffee mug that you can go fill up at uh, over here before you leave. If there's any left from Annie Mays, I'm sure he'll um, fill them up for you for a small little price at the coffee shop as well and, um, and to stay warm. Um, I also, as we close, do want to give another shout out. I hope that they're watching. You know, Sonia's on Facebook Live a lot, so I'm, I'm hoping that maybe James and Sonia are tuning in um, because I do want them to know that we appreciate them greatly. We wish them the very best, and we're so thankful for the 45 years that they gave us in the jewelry business in Southeast Kansas and wish them all the very best. So be sure and stop by before next Friday and um, and congratulate them on their on their retirement and thank them for supporting both of our communities and the county. So with that, we're going to have first Friday on February the 4th. Stay warm and have a really good weekend everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm like I'll forget them. I got to put them there.